Hey, what's up everyone? Today we're going to have a look at a developer platform known as Ops Level. So Ops Level has a bunch of different features that you would expect from a developer platform, but one of the big main features that I'm going to talk about today is the service catalog feature. Service catalogs are becoming more and more popular in today's world because the amount of services that an engineer needs to understand and maintain is growing by the day. So what a lot of organizations are doing is deploying service catalogs so their engineering teams have a better understanding of all the different services that they have out on their systems. This gives them a better understanding of who actually owns the service, what the dependencies are of that service, as well as how they can access all the different tooling for that service. Now, when it comes to deploying a service catalog, you usually have three different options. First, you could develop an in-house developer platform with your own engineers. This can be a good option if you need something that's highly customizable. However, the cost to develop an in-house solution can be quite expensive. The second solution is to use an open source solution such as Backstage. Now Backstage is a really feature rich developer platform and service catalog. However, it does require quite a bit of in-house expertise as well as a lot of startup time to get it right. Finally, you have the option to use a SaaS solution which works out of the box but does have monthly costs associated with it. So in this video, we're going to go over the third option, which is the SaaS solution ops level. And I'll show you how I got this set up and you can have a look at my setup and decide if this might be something that you want for your organization. So let's jump into the tutorial as I think it'll sort of speak for itself and it'll help you recognize how these features could help you out. Uh, stay towards the end of the video where I'll go over my final thoughts on ops level and and do keep in mind that this video was sponsored, but all the opinions that I give are of my own. All right, so we're in my ops level dashboard here, and you can see I already have quite a few different services. And all these services got populated through the mechanism of auto discovery using the Kubernetes integration and the AWS integration. That's where all my services live. Uh, let's go into one of these services. So I'm just gonna choose Grafana. And you can see there's quite a bit of information in each of these services. So this pane right here is the service overview, and it gives you information like the domain it's in, the system it's under, what type of product it is, as well as the owner and how you can contact the owner. So you can see this is owned by the DevOps team. We have their email address as well as their Slack channel. Now, all this information was manually filled out by myself when the service was auto-discovered but I only needed to do this for my first service. Once that was done, I went up here and I was able to download the ops level YAML file. So what I did was I just copied this and I put a copy in all my different code repositories. And then I just filled in the blanks. I changed the details uh, for those different services. So a couple of them had different owners. Some of them were a different tier or a different product. And of course the tooling URLs was different for a lot of my tools. So other than that, it just took about 10 to 15 minutes to fill out the different ops level files and then put them in their appropriate repositories. And once that was done, all my services had the information that they needed. Now I'm just gonna close out of this and go to some of the other tabs because there's a lot more information than just the service overview. So if you go to the operations tab, this is one of my favorite features of Ops Level because it has a link to all my different tooling, all my wiki articles, basically everything that I would want to know about this service and how to use this service, all the metrics, it's all in this single pane of glass right here. So you can see I can choose the environment. So some of my tooling links would be have different links for the different environments. I just have a production environment, so I'll just leave it as that. But you can see I can get to all these different pages. So if I wanted to see the Confluence article for it, I could open this. If I wanted to access this in Argo CD, I could go here. And if I wanted to see health checks, I have Kuma set up for this. So I'm just going to open up these three tabs. 
Here you can see it brought me right into Confluence and I have all the information in Confluence about Grafana. And here you can see Grafana in Argo CD. And in Kuma, it's showing me my uptime and availability for Grafana. So it's really cool that you can have this single pane of glass of ops level to have all your different tooling for your microservices integrated in this one place. All right, so let's check out a few more of these tabs. I'm going to go over to dependencies. Here you can see a simple dependency graph of my Grafana service. You can see a couple of services that it's dependent on. This is a dependency tree that I built myself using that ops level YAML file. Uh, we'll have a look at this a little bit later and we'll be able to see all the dependencies that all our services have. Uh, but for now, let's go over to the tech documents tab. And here you can see that it has a link to the readme for this uh, service. So it automatically found this on my GitHub. It found the readme. So it's just showing it here. Obviously, if I had other documentation, it would uh, have links to that as well. And you'd be able to view it from this dashboard. So it's just a convenient way to access your technical documentation. Now, these two other tabs are campaigns and maturity report. Let's go to maturity report for now. And here is a way to create maturity levels for your different services. So you can see that Grafana is giving the current maturity level of gold. Uh, but these are maturity checks that I set up myself. So if you scroll down here, you can see that we have bronze, silver, gold. You can actually add more maturity levels if you want, but let's have a look at the bronze level. And here, basically, as long as the service passes these checks, then it meets the bronze level. And then if it passes the silver checks, then it meets silver. And right now I don't have any gold checks, so it automatically passes the gold, but I will add a gold check later on in this video. Now, having a look at these checks, you can see that this one basically is a check to see if the service owner is defined, if the service language is defined, and a couple of different things. Basically, it's just asking, is this information filled out? If it is, then it meets this maturity level. Now, if you want to actually modify what these checks are and add your own checks, what you can do is just go on over to service maturity, then go on over to Rubik. And in here, you have all your different category levels. So by default, we have bronze, silver, and gold. Uh, you can add additional levels if you want, and I'll show you how to do that through settings later. If we want to add one, let's just add a gold check and you can choose whatever category you want. I will choose reliability and I'll go add check. And uh, there's a lot of default checks. You can also configure your own, but I'm just gonna choose one of these out of the box checks. So I'm gonna check for if service dependency has been defined. So I'll just do this. And there's a couple different configuration items that you can configure here. You can configure things like the filter, and this will filter for your different microservices. Right now, I only have a filter for my web services, uh, but I'm just gonna leave this blank and it's gonna apply to all my services. Uh, you can also check the owner, and I'm just gonna hit enabled. So this is a pretty simple check. Just check if service dependency is applied and just check all my different services services. So let's hit create and it'll take a moment here to fill out this information. But if I go to view report, I think a lot of the checks are going to come through and you can see here all my different services that do not meet this check. So all these different services do not have any dependencies defined. If I reorder this to my passing ones, you can see these ones are passing. And since Grafana had the dependencies defined, it is passing. And up here, you can see about 25 of my services are passing this check. So about 25 of my services probably meet that gold standard, while the other ones are going to be silver or bronze.
All right, so if you're wondering how I got all my different services in here, the way I did it was through auto discovery, through integrations. So if you go to integrations, you can add a new integration. I'm just gonna go to installed integrations so you can see my installed integrations. And basically my setup is I have GitHub repositories, I have a Kubernetes cluster, and I also have services running on AWS. So I connected up my AWS account, I connected up my Kubernetes cluster, and then I hooked up my GitHub repositories. And basically that's how all my different services got discovered. So I didn't have to manually configure any of those services. All these services got automatically discovered when I enabled these integrations. Okay, let's go back to integrations. And there's a couple other integrations that I have here. I have Gravana integrated. I have my Jenkins pipelines integrated as well as an integration with Slack. So I'm able to receive Slack notifications as well as interact with ops level using Slack. So I can actually find and query ops level through Slack. Now let's change gears a little bit and talk a little bit about self-service. So one of the big features that a developer platform should deliver is a self-service feature that your developers can use to run the tasks that they need to run. Now, of course, your developer could log on to a Jenkins server and run a pipeline from there. You could give them the permissions to do that, but doing it through a platform like this provides a setup with a lot less friction. So you can see that I have quite a few different actions set up here, such as creating a Datadog incident or rolling back a deployment. So these are actions that I have built out through templates using ops level to automate some different tasks. Let's go ahead and run one of these. So I'm gonna run my Jenkins pipeline for web build. And basically this is just a Jenkins pipeline that is integrated through ops level. So I'm gonna choose a service and I've configured this action to only have access to my Flask app. So I'll choose that one and I'll hit next. And then I set up a couple different environments that they can run the pipeline against. So I'll run it against production and hit execute. And basically it's just starting a Jenkins pipeline and it's gonna run the build. So when it comes to the different actions that you wanna create, the sky is the limit. You could basically automate anything that you wanted to. All right, so there's still quite a few different things that I haven't gone over in this video, but I will go over a few more things. Uh, you can see in catalog, this is where you can set up your systems, domains, and infrastructure. But what I wanna talk about right now is the people, and this is where you set up your different users and teams. So you can see I have four different users set up for my little lab scenario that I got going on. And these people are all part of different teams. So if you go to teams, you can see which services the teams are responsible for. So you can see the DevOps team has quite a few different responsibilities as well as the SRE team. Information about these teams is available if you hop into it. So you can see that you can configure the different responsibilities they have, the different contact methods, as well as the members. So if I wanted to add an additional member to this group, I could just uh, add them just like this. Now, one thing I didn't show off here is if you scroll down, you can see everything that the group owns. So you can see all the services, systems, domains, infrastructure, and repositories. So all these services, systems, and domains all got populated through that ops level YAML file that I configured and put into my repository. Now, we haven't really discussed what domains and systems, as well as what infrastructure is when it comes to ops level. Uh, so let me do a quick rundown on that right now. Infrastructure is pretty simple to understand. This is things like AWS VPCs. It's your core infrastructure components. Now, domains and systems, these are basically organizational units that you can set up based on how your organization operates. So domains is the bigger bucket and systems is the smaller bucket. So your domains are gonna contain multiple different systems and your systems are gonna contain multiple different services. So a quick example would be something like an e-commerce platform, that would be a domain. And then you would have the different systems that make up that e-commerce platform 
like the front end systems and the back end systems, and they would all be part of that same domain. Now, this is all very easy to set up. You just go to catalog and you can configure these whatever way makes sense for your organization. All right, so there's one more thing that I wanna show off here, which is the settings. So I'm gonna go over to settings and account, and this is how you can customize some of the different things that comes with ops level. So some of the tags that we give it is a service tier, as well as a service lifecycle. So if you don't like the default naming of these tiers or the description, as well as the service lifecycle, you can come in here and edit it and customize it to your needs. Now, if you scroll to the bottom here, we have our different service levels, such as beginner, bronze, silver, and gold. This is where we can add an additional level. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hit add level, and then add a level called platinum, and say this is the best level for our services. Go ahead and hit save, and now the platinum level is available for our different services as long as I add the check. So if I go back up and go to service maturity, Rubik, it's gonna be in here in this level, and I can just add a check. And I'm gonna add the check that the API documents need to be added here, just a simple check. Go ahead and hit enabled and create. All right, so I hope the video tutorial was helpful on helping you understand what a modern developer platform can provide you. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, I wanted to give my opinion on my thoughts of Ops Level, and I think it's a very good service catalog. This is something I definitely would implement to an organization that doesn't already have a service catalog. I would definitely go the software as a service route over customized in-house developer platforms. I found in the past when I've been on teams that tried to create these types of tools, the cost of bringing them up and maintaining them was just significantly higher than what we expected. Now, as for deploying an open source solution such as Backstage, that does sound pretty appealing, especially for an engineer like myself that likes to tinker around. But I think realistically for most organizations, they're gonna wanna go the software as a solution Service. route. You're gonna get up and running right away. You're gonna be able to get all your services discovered, all your third-party integrations integrated at a very low cost. It's really up to the organization and and how large their engineering team is and how much they want to spend maintaining it. But I think in most cases, you gotta go the software as a solution route. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a comment below and feel free to ask any questions. Thanks again for watching and I hope to see you all in the next video.